Okay, I guess let's get started. Uh, so today we're going to cover uh, memory controllers and then memory interference and quality of service. This is a topic that you're not unfamiliar with, but we're going to go a little bit deeper uh, than we have done in the past. So I'm going to actually skip some of the slides because some of them you've already seen, but this is a good opportunity to remember uh, some of what you've seen also. So as, uh, as you know, memory controllers are important and they're getting more critical as we've discussed uh, so far in the lecture. And they exist in many places uh, in the memory hierarchy. A cache controller is a memory controller, a DRAM controller is a memory controller, an SSD is a memory controller also. Uh, but in general, uh, it becomes difficult to build a memory controller for especially memories that have long latency. So it's easier to build a cache controller, for example. It's not as sophisticated. But when you go to a DRAM uh, or SSD or phase change memory, as we will discuss later, uh, some sort of uh, main memory or storage device, it becomes more difficult to build the controller because there are a lot of things that you need to consider as we will see. And in general, long latency memories have similar characteristics that need to be controlled. And in the rest of this lecture, we'll discuss DRAM as an example, but, and DRAM is a really great example, of course, because all of our main memories uh, are built with DRAM today, except for a very small fraction. Uh, and uh, we'll use DRAM as an example, but many scheduling and control issues that we will discuss are similar in the design of controllers for other types of memories. In general, memory is similar to each other uh, in, in the way it's built. So all types of memories are built using subarrays that we've discussed, and then you form banks. And then with, with banks, uh, you, a chip has so, some number of banks, and then you form ranks out of them if you build a module and then you connect it to the processor. The other reason why long latency memories are also difficult to control compared to short latency memories is because they're usually off chip, uh, as we've discussed, because then, then now you need to interface with the outside uh, of uh, the processor chip. Uh, so some other memories that we may see later on are flash memory, for example, and other emerging memory technologies like phase change memory and spin transfer torque, magnetic memory or memristors RM. They all have characteristics that are similar to the UM. And some of them actually have even more constraints, uh, like endurance, wear leveling, uh, cells wear out, for example, in flash memory. So you need to handle those things. Uh, that's what this bullet means, basically. These other technologies can also place other demands on the controller that DRAM may not place. So before we go into a DRAM, this is just to give you an example of how sophisticated a memory controller can be. Uh, this is an SSD controller. Uh, clearly, uh, modern SSDs are built using uh, flash memory, and flash memory is quite complicated today. Uh, I'll mention a paper that you may want to take a look at if you're interested in it, and we may actually have a lecture in the future about uh, SSDs in general, since they're really a critical part of computing systems today. Uh, as I said some time ago, uh, my cell phone would not have been possible, in my opinion, if you didn't have a good SSD in it, uh, or laptops would not have been in the form factors that we have today if we don't have good SSDs in it. But if you look over here, uh, an SSD controller overall is similar to a DRAM controller, but they do a lot more. Uh, clearly, they're flash memory specific, assuming this flash memory. In the future, this may also become phase change memory or 3DX point, for example. Intel already has SSD products using 3DX point, but they're still not as cost effective as flash memory based SSD pro uh, products. But uh, they do much more because flash memory is actually uh, have a lot of errors, uh, a lot of different error mechanisms. So these SSD controllers have very sophisticated uh, error correction mechanisms, very sophisticated error correction codes they employ. So today DRAMs are starting to employ error correcting codes internally uh, or maybe in the memory controller. Uh, but flash memory, if you don't employ ECC, uh, you're bound to actually get errors very quickly because these memories are very much uh, uh, vulnerable to noise, many different types of noise, as I will show you in the next slide or one of the next slides. As a result, uh, these controllers need to be very, very sophisticated. So keep in mind that a controller uh, need, may need to do ECC and very sophisticated error correction also. Basically, basically what, what is error correction? You store error correcting codes along with the data and you read the data and you check if the error correct, uh, you decode the error correcting codes and you see if there has been an error. And if, if the error is correctable, using the redundant error correcting codes that you've stored, that's great. You correct the error and you write back the data so that the data is correct and you fix the problem. 
And if the error is not correctable, then you have a problem basically. If you, you can detect potential of the error, if it's detectable but not correctable, uh, that's good. At least you know that you are not going to use the data. Uh, so at least you can stop at that point. This is called fail stop on a failure uh, in read you stop. But if the error is not detectable and not correctable, then you have a big problem clearly, right? Uh, then you have silent data corruption, what it's called. Uh, and if, if, if you have silent data corruption, you don't even know you have erroneous computation, right? Uh, this is very similar to the Byzantine failures that we've discussed uh, earlier, uh, in a sense, very similar to Rohammer also potentially. Uh, so these errors clearly happen uh, for various reasons as we will also see very quickly. Uh, but there are other things that an SSD controller does uh, like rare leveling, for example, because uh, whenever you write to a cell, you actually uh, reduce, eat away from the endurance of the cell, meaning you can do only some number of writes to the cell before the cell, cell actually fails. And that leads to controllers doing sophisticated management of wear out uh, across the cell such that each cell or each row, let's say, or each page uh, wears almost equally. This way you can extend the lifetime of the entire uh, storage in flash memory. Uh, because if, if some of the cells wear out uh, earlier, then you're actually reducing the size of your storage, right? So this wear leveling is also implemented in the uh, SSD controller. There's also voltage optimization that I'm not going to talk about at this point, but flash memory data is stored in terms of voltages. And sometimes you need to change the voltages with which you're reading to minimize the error rates. And if you're really interested, you can read uh, this paper, for example, but uh, I will give you another a survey paper in a little bit. They do garbage collection because whenever you erase a page in flash memory, uh, you, you don't, uh, well, you cannot use a page. You cannot reuse a page in flash memory without erasing it. And uh, page erase takes a long time in flash memory, uh, I should say block. So I, I, we haven't introduced flash memory a lot, but let's assume that you cannot erase a page in flash memory without actually, uh, you cannot use a, a page in flash memory without erasing it. And erase actually takes a long time in flash memory. And uh, you basically need to keep track of pages that are ready, uh, ready to be erased, that are not erased, and that are also erased. So this leads to sophisticated garbage collection mechanisms in flash memory. And then you need to do a page remapping to actually handle garbage collection very well. So there are many, many things that we're not going to go about right now, but hopefully this gives you an idea of how sophisticated a memory controller can get depending on the properties of uh, the memory device over here uh, that you see. And you can see people actually employ processors like full processors and the controller. This is a, you could, it's, it's not uncommon to see ARM processors, for example, in an SSD controller, but it's not just processors, it's also uh, hardware. Uh, so you, you, you really have application specific circuitry as well and some reconfigurable circuitry potentially as well as part of your SSD controller. So it's, it's actually a very sophisticated system in itself uh, just to manage uh, the memory uh, that is connected to it. And its goal is really to manage the memory and uh, send the data back to the host as the host requested or write the data that the host is writing. Uh, you can also see that there's a buffer over here. So there's a DRAM buffer in modern SSDs. So you have a huge storage here, but you may actually have, usually you have uh, some gigabytes of DRAM, at least one gigabyte in existing systems. So it's actually a pretty big DRAM you have over here. And the goal of that buffer is to minimize the number of writes that you do to flash memory such that you don't wear out flash memory as much and also uh, to make it nicer uh, to write data into flash memory. You could also use it as a read buffer to minimize the latency uh, because clearly DRAM is much faster than flash memory. Uh, and there are other things that are added more recently based on this paper that we have written. Uh, people started adding a lot of refresh mechanisms to ensure that the lifetime of memory uh, increases. Uh, uh, and there are particular refresh mechanisms that are proposed in this work, for example, I'm not going to go into right now, uh, that are very interesting. Uh, so a flash memory also needs to be refreshed because you overall it's charge based and over time you lose charge. And you lose charge even more if the uh, cells have worn out uh, a lot. So to extend the lifetime, you really need to refresh flash memory. Okay, so I spent a lot of time on this to, just to give you an idea of a very sophisticated uh, memory controller, in this case, an SSD controller. So DRAM controllers are actually less sophisticated, but they have different types of requirements also. So DRAM, for example, doesn't have 
as sophisticated ECC today. And it's unlikely it's, it's going to have as sophisticated ECC because fundamentally DRAM is a, a better technology than flash, let's say, uh, in, even at, at, at scaled uh, levels uh, in terms of reliability. Uh, it doesn't have the rare leveling issues, at least currently. It doesn't have the voltage optimization issues. It doesn't have the garbage collection and pager mapping issues. So these are really specific mechanisms for flash memory. And a lot of these mechanisms actually uh, will also come about in uh, emerging memory technologies like phase change memory as well, because they also have wear out problems, for example. They also have a lot of different error mechanisms. Uh, and uh, they can also store multiple bits per cell uh, like flash memory. And uh, to be, uh, that, uh, as a result, they're more prone to errors. Uh, okay, I think this is where I'll, I'll stop uh, uh, in terms of flash memory controllers. But if you're interested, uh, I mean, this may be a better view of the SSD controller since this is based on a, a picture that we drew uh, five years later uh, than when we actually wrote this particular paper. But you can see that this is another paper with a better picture, but you can see it's a similar thing. There, there are also other things that are done over here, which I'm not gonna talk about compression, for example, or randomization of data to minimize uh, noise uh, that you have in the cells, uh, and potentially encryption also is em em employed in the controller so that you, you don't store data in unencrypted form. Uh, and encryption enables other folks, uh, well, some security in your storage, because if someone takes your storage, uh, they may not be able to decrypt the data if it's encrypted, right? Okay, so clearly there are other things that are being pushed into the controller to, be to make it more intelligent, like compression, encryption, randomization of data in addition to management of memory. So you can see that this is a very sophisticated intelligent controller. And this is what I mean by, what I meant by existing, some existing controllers already have intelligence in them, as you can see. It could clearly computation capability also because comp compression and encryption are computations that you do uh, on the data that's stored. And you can see internally the uh, flash memory has some resemblance to uh, the, and there are multiple channels over here. And I, again, I'm not going to go through this. If you're really interested actually in how a modern flash memory controller works at a high level and uh, how, it, how it actually does the error correction, mitigation and recovery, I'd, I strongly recommend that you take a look at this paper that we have written uh, in 2017. And this was based on research that we've done for more than eight years at the time, but we surveyed not our research, but many other research as well as existing products uh, that existed, uh, and uh, they, they're still doing the same thing actually, but you can take a look at this if you're interested. And there's an, uh, and if you look at that, you will see that there are a, a bunch of different error types uh, in uh, flash memory and many different mitigation mechanisms employed by controllers. And you can find uh, descriptions of the errors as well as the correction uh, and mitigation mechanisms in the paper. And you can see that uh, the mitigation mechanisms are sometimes specific to different types of errors, right? For example, this particular mitigation mechanism, neighbor cell assisted error correction, which is employed by uh, flash controllers today, it, it's very specific to cell to cell interference uh, uh, errors. Okay, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but I think it's really fascinating. So if you're similarly fascinated, please take a look. There's a lot of opportunity for research in having better SSD controllers, not just in terms of reliability, but also in terms of performance optimization and many other things that we've discussed uh, in this picture uh, earlier. Okay, so if you're really interested, actually, you should read this more up-to-date version, which is uh, published as a book chapter in this uh, Inside Solid State Drives book, which I would also recommend because that way you can actually see uh, other stuff that's going on inside the solid state drives. But this paper is, a, is an extended form that talks about 3D uh, flash memory even more, but this still needs to be updated, I think. Uh, Okay, so if you're interested, you can read more about SSD controllers. I'm not going to talk more about them, but these are some recent works that we have published. But now let's talk about DRAM uh, a little bit more because uh, SSDs, we can go on and on and ha have multiple lectures on it. But uh, I think DRAM is also quite interesting, as you know. Uh, and uh, your, uh, your third lab assignment is really about uh, building controllers uh, for DRAM uh, using Ramulator. So hopefully you'll have fun with it. So we'll cover some of the things that you're going to build uh, in this lecture. Uh, but uh, we have uh, talked about uh, this slide a little bit in the past. So I'm going to go through some of these relatively quickly. But you already know that DRAM has different types with different interface optimized for different purposes, uh, like DDI interfaces, commodity, uh, low power interfaces exist for especially mobile processors, 
high bandwidth interfaces, high bandwidth types of DRAM exist for, uh, especially graphics. You can see the GDDR designation over here, graphics DDR. Low latency DRAM exists, it's very high cost. We discussed in the last lecture. Uh, and we looked at low cost mechanisms of getting low latency uh, clearly. And 3D stack DRAMs also exist. And we discussed this many times uh, as well earlier, uh, as you remember. Uh, okay. And there are other types, which I'm not going to talk about. But it's important to keep in mind that the underlying microarchitecture of DRAM is fundamentally the same. What is different in these is really the interface, how you interface with the chip, what kind of uh, protocols do you use, uh, what kind of timing parameters do you use, uh, what, how many banks do they have, uh, are they 3D stacked, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and ideally, a flexible memory controller can support various DRAM types. But this is very ideal, as we also discussed in the past lectures, because this clearly complicates the memory controller. You don't need to, uh, well, you not, not only you need to design a memory controller that supports different types, let's say, uh, which may be OK is if, it's, if it were just the timing parameters, uh, the number of banks, uh, I don't know, the number of subarrays, if you are aware of subarrays. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, if it were uh, and the bit width, let's say, if, if, if it were just those, it may be okay. But the problem is, it's really the analog interface that becomes a problem. Basically, analog interface is different for these different DRAM types. I mean, even between DDR3 and DDR4, the analog interface is different. LPDDR5, LPDDR4, they're different. DDR4, DDR5, different. And across the different types, they're different. And this is really the most expensive part. I mean, this is a very high speed analog interface, as we've discussed. and uh, building a single high-speed analog interface for one, si one single DRAM type is expensive and difficult enough that building many different interfaces makes it, I mean, it's extremely costly, clearly, right? And all of these require different types of pins because they're very much dominated by the analog signaling and interface. Now your pin count also increases if you really want to build many of these on a single die, uh, then it becomes even more costly. Okay, so we've already discussed this, so I'm not going to go into more detail. Uh, but you can see the DRAM types from the Ramulator paper, which we briefly discussed in the past as well. Uh, you're going to use the Ramulator simulator for uh, your assignment number three. We decided uh, it's a good idea to switch simulators. And the simulator is used by both industry and academia heavily uh, to, uh, to do uh, st architectural studies on main memory. And we, we released the simulator. This, the history behind it is actually, this was based on a simulator that we had written while, while I was at Microsoft Research as early as 2006. And we improved it over and over. When I went to CMU, my students actually improved it greatly and made a really nice simulator. And we, uh, we, did, we investigated a lot of cool new ideas using the simulator. And at some point, we decided that it would be good to release it to the community in a cleaned up fashion, of course. Uh, and we released in 2015. And after that, a lot of industry, uh, big companies like Google, Apple, Intel, they picked it up and they used it. And they actually provided bug reports so that we can fix things in the simulator. So this is actually a simulator. You will be working with a simulator that's really state of the art and that's being used by industry as well as academia uh, on uh, both investigating new DRAM architectures as well as investigating uh, new memory controllers. And people use Ramulator as part of their full system uh, or other uh, simulators as well. So it could be just simulating your main memory. OK, uh, I'm not going to go through this, but this is, again, to jog your memory from uh, last uh, lecture where we looked at different types of memory. So this clearly shows that there are many different types of uh, memory today. right? And the, the beauty of Ramulator is it can model uh, essentially all of these different types uh, uh, which, which really uh, fill the gap. And if you're really interested, you can read the Ramulator paper. And I recommend doing so since you're going to be using a simulator. If, uh, I think it's really important for uh, architects or people to understand the simulator that they're using really well. And I think Ramulator is relatively simple enough to understand. Uh, although, of course, any software uh, takes some time to understand, right? It's not, it's, in the end, it's software. So you, if you don't put the, put the effort to understand it, you're not going to be able to understand it easily. It doesn't come for free. So it takes time to understand, of course. But I think this is uh, one of the easier, our, our, one of our goals uh, in writing simulator, uh, emulator was to actually make it easy for people to understand what's going on and change it, change what's going on, because we really want it to be flexible uh, so that you can model 
many different types of DRAM, as you've seen. And other people are modeling different types of non-volatile memory as well uh, using RAM later today. OK, so you also know that we discussed uh, in this paper uh, different DRAM types and workloads, but I'm not going to go cover this. Uh, so for example, this paper uh, released a RAM later connected to a GP GPU simulator. So you can actually connect this memory simulator to any other type of simulator. It could be your machine learning accelerator simulator. If it's using DRAM as the main memory, you could connect it to uh, that simulator. Uh, so we, we may talk about simulation later on in lectures, but this is just to give you an idea that it's, it's important. Simulation is a critical tool of the architect to really evaluate new ideas because uh, it's impossible to build real hardware for every single idea that you have. And it's Im impractical, basically. Otherwise, you will never get to investigate uh, your ideas uh, and different types of ideas uh, uh, as, as aggressively as you can, uh, because building hardware clearly takes time for everything. And it's not worthwhile to build hardware. So simulation is a really key, key tool to investigate different ideas. And uh, it's important to design good simulators that can enable you to investigate those ideas relatively easily, flexibly, and accurately at the same time. OK, so uh, the, the topic of this lecture is DRAM controllers, but it's intimately tied with the simulators. That's why I talked about simulators quite a bit. Uh, but DRAM controller, let's take a look at uh, what a DRAM controller needs to do. So first of all, most importantly, it needs to ensure correct operation of DRAM. So it needs to obey refresh and timing. It needs to service DRAM requests while obeying the timing constraints of DRAM chips. And there are many, many constraints, as we've discussed, resource conflicts, bank bus channel, minimum write to read delays are one example. Minimum read to write delays are another example. Uh, write recovery time is another example. There are many things that you read in some of the papers and that you're going to see also uh, in, in your modeling. And it needs to translate requests to DRAM command sequences because requests don't tell you what bank, what bus, what channel. It gives you an address. And the uh, memory controller needs to know what's happening in that address, meaning in that bank, uh, in that uh, channel. And if the bank is busy or if the row is open, if the row is not open. So it needs to keep track of all of those resources. And on top of this, it needs to buffer and schedule requests uh, to enable high performance. Uh, this should be fixed. Uh, let me remove that. So this is online error correction, as you can see. Uh, so it needs to provide quality of service, as we've discussed. It needs to do reordering. It needs to do row buffer, bank, rank, bus management. So there's a lot to do here. It needs to manage power consumption and thermals in DRAM, turn on and off DRAM chips, manage power modes to minimize power consumption, which is increasingly important in memory today. Uh, and this is the minimum functionality here, actually. I don't even include error correcting codes, for example. Some memory controllers have error correcting codes internally. Some memory controllers do scrambling uh, of da data, randomization of data to minimize uh, transmission errors, for example, reduce reliability issues. Uh, and if you think about the research proposals, the memory control needs to be even more intelligent, right? Online profiling of retention times, for example, or fixing the row hammer errors with different mechanisms that we've discussed. Uh, like Para is one example. So clearly the functions are increasing today, but this is the bare minimum uh, that you need. And a modern uh, DRAM controller, the result is also complex. This is a high level picture. You can see it gets requests from different uh, agents, let's say, and then it arbitrates among those requests. And it's, uh, it may be built using this way. Uh, so it, uses some, it does some address translation to figure out which uh, bank and which channel uh, the request goes to, and then it uh, creates commands. So the request says, I want to get this data from this address, right? Now the memory controller needs to translate it to uh, an activate uh, command or a pre-charge command, an activate command, and a read command, and then maybe another pre-charge command, right? So you need to basically uh, translate the request uh, to commands, DRAM commands, because DRAM doesn't understand requests at the current interface. And then the commands need to go through this analog interface, as you see over here. Uh, there's electrical and analog signaling that needs to happen over here. And this is, uh, we're going to talk about controller in this part over here. We're not going to talk about the analog, as I said, because this is really uh, all about high speed analog circuit design, which is fascinating, but that's not the subject of this course. Uh, okay, so a modern DM controller looks like this. This is another picture of it. Uh, this is from a multi core controller and from this paper which we will briefly talk about later on. But basically, you get requests from different cores. And uh, they can go to any bank, as you can see over here. This is a single channel over here. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, they, in this particular case, these different banks have different buffers that buffer the requests. And then they have different schedulers and a scheduler picks one request that's ready over here. And uh, let's say command that's ready. And then the schedulers also need to arbitrate uh, because if both of them, if two of these bank schedulers have commands that are ready uh, because you have only a single uh, DRM bus uh, to control any of the banks, uh, they need to arbitrate between each other and you can, you can only select one over here. So there, there are multiple levels of arbitration that's happening, as you can see. One arbitration happens at the bank level. The other arbitration happens at the channel level or the bus level, if you will. Uh, okay, so clearly you can have different arbitration algorithms uh, over here. And we've seen some of the arbitration algorithms or prioritization algorithms or scheduling policies. FCFS is oldest request first, first come, first served. It, this is really no scheduling in a sense, right? Uh, well, uh, I guess it's, it's really some scheduling. You, you still need to know which one's oldest in this case. Uh, you could also pick randomly clearly, uh, but we don't usually do random scheduling in DRAM. But uh, you need to know the age of the request or arrival time. Uh, we already seen uh, that and uh, we already discussed that. This is not good for quality of service, right? But we, already sa we also said that uh, at least um, at the time, uh, at, at an earlier time, Many memory controllers uh, were uh, using a variant of this robot for hit first policy, first ready, first come, first serve. So you prioritize robot for hit requests or other requests, and all else being equal, you prioritize older requests over uh, younger requests. So this is a prioritization order. So if there are no row hit requests, you basically prioritize older requests over other requests, clearly, right? So the goal, as we discussed, was to maximize robot for hit rate, maximize DRAM throughput. Uh, and we will see this again. But actually, as you uh, see, uh, even, even this description uh, has some uh, tension with how DRAM is really controlled, right? Scheduling really is done at the command level. Although actually, uh, you could do it at both levels. You could actually do request scheduling and then command scheduling whenever you're, do whenever you're designing a DRAM controller. Or you could decide not to do request scheduling, but just do command scheduling. Uh, or you could do, actually do request scheduling and then leave the commands in order uh, I don't know how you manage that, but you could potentially do that as well. But basically, many memory controllers today, high-performance memory controllers, do scheduling at the command level. They basically convert the requests into commands, uh, meaning uh, read, write, activate, pre-charge. Those are example commands, right? Refresh is another command. Uh, and they prioritize column commands over row commands. What does this mean? If you have a read, write command that you can generate, that means that a row buffer is already open meaning that you should prioritize that over activate and pre-charge commands that go to different rows, uh, clearly that are operate, uh, opening or closing rows. And within each group of commands, column or row commands, uh, you uh, the memory controller prioritizes older commands over younger ones. So this is a command level uh, implementation of FRFCFS. And clearly this is a simplification because I haven't even talked about how to do writes or reads. One of the difficulties in DRAM is you cannot do writes at the same time as you're doing reads. Well, you can overlap them very little, but you really need to batch them because uh, uh, whenever you're doing writes, you're really pushing data out into the DRAM. So a DRAM bus operates on one direction. And if you want to actually read data, you need to change the direction of the bus, directionality of the bus, and that takes time. That's why we have this read to write latencies that need to be obeyed and write to write, write to read transition latencies that need to be obeyed. And as a result, uh, you're not truly random access, as you can see, right? Clearly, you cannot do writes while you're doing reads. You need to pay a penalty to switch to the read mode uh, or write mode, and vice versa. Uh, you need to pay a penalty to switch to the uh, read mode if you're doing writes. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, whenever you're thinking of writes in DM, these are usually write backs from the caches. So they're not usually critical to the program's progress, right? Because uh, what is the write back from the cache? You've evicted some data from the cache and you really don't need this uh, data. It, it happened to be dirty, it, but it just needs to be written back uh, into DRAM, right? Uh, to make things consistent. Uh, so writes are usually less critical than reads. But if you don't service the writes, uh, the buffers in the memory controller will fill up. And as a result, uh, they may start delaying the reads significantly. So you need to carefully manage how you do the writes in DRAM so that they don't delay your reads. And this becomes important. And there are papers written on this topic. I will mention one of them, I think, when I talk about 
uh, some timing parameters very briefly. Uh, so this is right to read scheduling is also important in DRAM. How do you handle it? Which even though we've ignored it so far, if you remember. And this becomes a bigger problem in emerging memories or flash memory uh, because write latencies are much longer than read latencies in some emerging memory. So in DRAM, write latency is actually very similar to the read latency, uh, except for the write recovery latency, uh, uh, which may be increasing. So ignore that for now, but on, 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 on some ballpark, read and write latencies are relatively similar in DRAM. But if you look at uh, phase change memory, for example, uh, write latencies are much longer, as we will discuss in a later lecture. As a result, you need to uh, take care of read-write scheduling even more carefully in those memories. And in, in flash memory, as I said, uh, write latencies are much longer because you may actually need to erase an entire block, which takes really long, like more than 10 times uh, longer than a read. And as a result, uh, you need to be very careful in terms of how you schedule the writes and reads so that you don't delay the programs uh, significantly. So you can see how sophisticated things get once you start controlling uh, DM. Uh, uh, you may you may say, uh, okay, let me let me handle that later on. Actually, you may say, uh, why do we have different types of latencies? Well, to, uh, the the goal is really to optimize performance, right? You can, if you don't have different types of latencies, uh, there are multiple different ways of doing it. Uh, but we will discuss that uh, in a little bit. Okay, so DM bank operation, I'm going to skip this because you've already seen this multiple times, even in this class, uh, if you haven't seen it in earlier classes. So clearly we have row buffer and we have row buffer hits and row buffer conflicts. And clearly these take different amounts of time and you already know the structure very well. So I'm going to skip this to the uh, next slide. And we already know that the scheduling policy in DRAM is a pri request prioritization order or a command prioritization order. And prioritization can be based on many things. Request age, row buffer hit miss status, FRFCFS takes into account both. Or it could be request type, read, write, prefetch. So that now prefetch actually becomes important also. Or it could be the request or type, meaning it's a, is the load miss that's re, re, uh, requesting this read or is the store miss in the processor? Because store miss may not be as important, right? Load miss is really important because you really need the data. But storm, it says you need to write it to the cache and the pro program can still continue uh, progressing because you don't immediately need the data for a dependent instruction. Whereas in a load miss, the load is really dependent uh, on the data that's, that you, that's coming from memory. And there may be other dependent instructions also. How critical is the request for some definition of criticality? We will discuss criticality a lot actually when we talk about multi-threaded workloads. For example, a, a memory request may be weighted on by 10 different threads because it's so important they're sharing some data or lock uh, that they, they all want to get. And that becomes a very critical data clearly, clearly right? Uh, or another definition of criticality is, is this miss the oldest one in the core? Or is this a younger one? Maybe the oldest one is more important, right? How many instructions in the core are dependent on it? Uh, and how, how, how well you can overlap the latency of this request. If you can overlap the latency well, such that it doesn't affect performance that much, maybe it's not that critical, right? If you, uh, this is the notion of memory level parallelism that we've discussed briefly. Will it stall the processor basically? That's what I mentioned, I, I meant just now. Or interference caused to other cores. Will this request, uh, is this request causing a lot of interference to the other cores? Is it delaying some other cores? So clearly you can take into account all of this information and who knows what else, right? And we will see some of those things uh, in terms of what else uh, in, 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 in this particular part of the lecture. Uh, but clearly there's uh, no limit to the creativity of a, a designer. But of course, it's very difficult to take into account all of this information because uh, if you actually try to take into account all of this information and who knows what else, then the prioritization logic becomes much more difficult to build because now your priority values become longer and prioritization uh, in, uh, essentially is an encoding and decoding problem, right? If your priority values are huge, you need to compare those prior to values across different uh, requests. Uh, and uh, you cannot basically build a large request buffer. Or even if you build a large request buffer, it becomes a very long latency to actually do this prioritization. So uh, keep in mind that it's not easy to build. Uh, even if you can imagine uh, great prioritization ideas, uh, it may not be easy to build the idea. But I think it's always good to start uh, imagining uh, what the high level creative uh, conceptual ideas should be 
and then think about building. And as a researcher, I think this is a really good perspective. Initially, if you don't be constrained too much about building, imagine first, and then think about how to actually implement. Uh, of course, uh, don't ignore implementation in the end, because if you just imagine, uh, what you imagine may not be something that's easily implementable. And as a result, it may not be adopted ever. Right? So it's good to have a balance between both, but uh, don't let the implementation dictate your creativity to begin with. That's, the, that's, uh, that's my big advice in general in, to architects. If, don't be too implementation focused to begin with, basically. Start with thinking broadly and creatively and think about how to actually make it work, assuming it's a good idea. Well, how do you determine it's a good idea? You determine it using simulation of real workloads. Okay, so we've seen some policies. Let me go over robo for management policies relatively quickly. There are multiple different ways of managing row buffer. Uh, open row means that after you access a row, you keep the row open. So you've activated the row. What do you do with it after you're done with the requests? Uh, so the upside is if you keep the row open, the next access might need the same row. As a result, it will get a row hit. That's great. So if the program has this behavior, you keep the row open. However, if the next access needs a different row in the same bank, you get a row conflict. As a result, by keeping the row open, you delayed the next request because now you need to do a pre-charge or memory control needs to do a pre-charge, but you also wasted energy because keeping the row open means that you're keeping the sense amplifiers active. And as a result, you're really uh, consuming more energy in the bank uh, than you would otherwise consume. Keeping the row closed, if you're closing the row or, or pre-charging the array, what does that mean? That means that you're pre-charging the bit lines to VDD over two, meaning that the sense amplifier is not enabled. You're not continuously restoring the charge uh, in the DUF. As a result, it's less energy clearly. Okay, so if you close the row, you close, uh, basically, if you have a closed row policy in your memory control, you close uh, the memory control closes the row after an access. Of course, it's a smart policy, meaning if no other requests already in the request buffer need the same row, because if some other request actually needs it, you're better off really take, uh, 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 taking advantage of the uh, row buffer in that case. But if there are no other requests, then you close the row. Clearly, there are variants of this, right? If there are n requests that are waiting or close the row after n requests as opposed to after an access immediately, uh, there may be other variants. So this works well if the next access needs a different row. This way you avoid a row conflict, which is great, important in terms of performance as well as energy, of course. Uh, but if the next access needs the same row, then you have a problem. You close the row, but you incur an extra activate to the same row. This doesn't sound good, right? So you really need to, a better policy is really predicting uh, or being adaptive, meaning predicting whether or not the next access to the bank will be to the same row and choosing the open row policy if that is the case. If that is not the case, choosing the closed row policy. So this is an adaptive policy. It's employed in modern memory systems, modern memory controllers. It's a good idea, but clearly it works if the prediction is correct. It doesn't work very well if the prediction is not correct. OK, so I'm not going to go through this uh, table, but basically this table shows uh, different policies. And what happens, uh, the, the commands that are needed for next access if the first access is to this row and the next access is to this particular row and different cases. So you can actually go through this and uh, it's relatively easy to figure out. OK, let me, uh, before I go into uh, some ideas, uh, let me talk about power management also. Uh, we're not going to talk a lot about power management of memory, although it's increasingly important. DM chips actually have power modes. Uh, and the idea is to power, the, power down the chip or bank uh, or different granularities when you're not accessing it. So there are multiple power states. Active is the highest power. Uh, all banks idle is another power. Power down is another power. Uh, basically, some of these, uh, I think in power down, for example, uh, you have all the row buffers closed in all banks. As a result, no bank actually has that. Uh, active is you're really accessing things, basically. Self-refresh is the lowest power. Basically, my cell phone is right now in self-refresh for DRAM, which is, uh, it's consuming a lot of power, basically, by refreshing DRAM. But basically, uh, memory is not active, but memory control just does self-refresh in this case. Uh, so you cannot access it. You cannot send a command. If a command comes from or if a request comes from a core, you need to get out of the self-refresh state. It takes time because you, a lot of uh, structures in DM are powered down or power gated uh, in this case, such that power is not supplied to them. 
So it takes time to power them up again uh, to get out of the self refresh state. So as a result, uh, it takes, uh, I think, I, I believe microseconds to get out of the self refresh state. So state transitions incur latency during which the chip cannot be accessed if you're in these different power states. Uh, and uh, the highest transition latency is from self refresh to any of these states actually. You know, so you can go to active from self refresh and it takes microseconds, for example. So clearly there's a trade off in terms of performance here. If you go into self refresh mode and you immediately need to access memory, then you need to pay the penalty of getting out of the self refresh mode, which could be microseconds. And you don't have enough benefit for being in self refresh mode because you didn't stay in that mode long enough. So uh, existing controllers have policies to decide when to go into self refresh mode, when to go into these different modes, et cetera, to uh, hopefully amortize the cost of going into the self refresh mode and maximize the benefit of going into the self refresh mode. Okay, or any modes, it re replace self refresh mode with any of the mode names uh, that I mentioned over here. So clearly this is an exciting topic, but we don't have time. And I believe the power management needs to change going into the future because these are very coarse grained power states. Maybe power states need to be per bank power states, maybe even per sub array power states going into the future. And maybe there need to be more power states. And we have a lot of work, for example, in terms of dynamic voltage and frequency scaling of DRAM uh, uh, at, at a finer, fine granularity as well as coarse granularity, uh, like you, at, at the bank granularity, for example, if you scale the voltage and frequency, you can save power significantly, assuming you don't get errors, of course. But I'm not going to talk about that. I mentioned this. Uh, briefly in the last lecture where we talk about latency. As I said uh, over there, if you reduce the voltage, uh, then you're actually reducing the power consumption because power consumption is directly correlated uh, with the square root uh, of voltage actually. But you may get errors because now circuits are operating much, much more slowly, uh, but you can fix those errors by increasing the latency uh, to DRAM. Uh, Okay, there's a question. How does self refresh power uh, save power compared to? Uh, I don't, I, don't I, I, I missed it, I think, because of my computer over here. Uh, let's see. How does self refresh save power compared to just idle? So basically, uh, in just idle, uh, you can still access DRAM. Uh, you don't turn off uh, the structures that enable access to DRAM. So you don't power down, for example, uh, the decoder uh, that needs to. Uh, enable you to access DRAM. You don't power down the uh, registers where you need to store the addresses in DRAM. Uh, so you're ready to access the DRAM relatively quickly, but you power down, for example, the row buffers. Uh, whereas in self-refresh, you power down all of the structures that are needed for to access DRAM. So internally, uh, there's some self-refresh circuitry uh, that uh, is designed just to do self-refresh. So it's a much more aggressive power down mode compared to uh, idle. So hopefully that answers your question. Basically in self-refresh, you, you save a lot more power because you basically turn off every other structure except some specialized circuitry that is just there to do self-refresh. And as a result, you don't uh, waste static energy uh, in those structures. You, you actually get rid of a lot of the leakage energy in those structures. Uh, and only leakage you have is really in the self-refresh circuitry, as well as, of course, doing the refresh itself. Okay. Okay. So let me go into uh, the difficulty of DRAM control, because uh, if, if it's not clear to you right now, hopefully it'll be clear that this is not easy to design. Uh, basically, as we discussed, you need to obey the DRAM timing constraints for correctness, and there are many timing constraints in DRAM. There are actually more than hundreds. And these are some examples, clearly, you can read about. Uh, I'm going to show you more. We've already read in some papers uh, the reasoning for these constraints also. You need to keep track of many resources to prevent conflicts. You need to handle DRM refresh. You need to manage power consumption. And on top of this, you need to optimize performance and quality of service in the presence of constraints. We're going to talk a lot more about quality of service in, this, uh, in the next lecture today. Uh, and reordering is not simple, as we've discussed, meaning prioritization is not simple if you keep adding different constraints and different uh, states to it. And fairness and quality of service needs complicates the scheduling problem also. So these are minimum, as I said, you may need to consider ECC, you may need to consider uh, row hammer, you, need, you may need to consider uh, minimizing the refreshes, uh, online profiling, et cetera. So there's a lot more complication. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting uh, because these are some of the hardest parts of the system to design uh, 
today. Uh, uh, I don't know if I, if I told the story, but uh, Chuck Tacker uh, was a technical fellow at Microsoft while I was designing DRM controllers uh, at Microsoft. At the same time, he was also designing DRM controllers. Chuck Tacker actually is one of the first people who uh, did early research into personal computers, Xerox Alto computer is one, one example. This is in 1960s, 1970s, uh, early in time. Uh, and he received the Turing Award uh, in 2009 for his contributions to these early personal computers. Uh, and he, uh, we were having conversations about memory controllers and he, he said that uh, he was designing the DDR3 controller for an FPGA engine. And uh, uh, during one of the conversations, he said that this is the worst thing, worst piece of hardware he's ever dealt with. Uh, in the world, because it's the most complex thing. Uh, and there's a lot of complexity that a human designer needs to deal with. And I agree with them. I think this is one of the worst piece of hardware. SSD controls also are actually pretty bad also, in my opinion. But DRAM controllers are bad because you need to deal with very, very high speed constraints. So SSD controllers are a little bit better because latencies are a bit longer. But DRAM controllers, you, if, you have, if you actually miss uh, the high speed, uh, then, then you cannot actually control things at low latencies that are needed in DRAM because DRAM is, I mean, regardless of however high latency it is, it's still low latency from the perspective uh, of the grant uh, system, right? It's much lower latency than an SSD, for example, clearly. Okay, so that anecdote uh, maybe will stay with you, but this is actually true. If you ever actually designed a DRAM controller, you need to deal with these constraints. And this is a paper that talks about how to uh, reduce the write-related latencies in DRAM by doing better scheduling, how to minimize the transitions between write mode and read mode, for example. Uh, and variants of this are actually implemented in some processors, some memory controllers. And you can see this is an example of uh, the latencies, uh, different types of timing constraints. This is, uh, I, as I recommended in an earlier lecture, uh, these papers actually examine the reasoning for different timing constraints really well. And they actually are better and easier to read than data sheets. Uh, for example, there's a timing constraint between activate and pre-charge. Let me actually go over here. Uh, for example, this, uh, this paper, the subarray level parallelism paper, which we briefly talked about in last lecture, talks about the reasoning for different timing constraints. For example, you're pre-charge right now, you send an activate command. It takes time to uh, get the sense amplifiers uh, in a, uh, uh, to uh, amplify the data and get the data, essentially sense the data. So there's a timing constraint between an activate and read, as you can see over here. Uh, there's some time until which the sense amplifiers uh, become stable. So there's an activate to read uh, time constraint. You can see it over here. It's a bank level time constraint or read, a read write time constraint. It's called TRCD over here. And 13 to 15 nanoseconds in this particular DRAM standard, DDR3, for example. So there are physical reasons why you need uh, these timing constraints, right? There's also another over here. Uh, there's an activate to pre-charge latency. Uh, basically, you, uh, you activate, and it takes time for everything to become really stable so that now you can actually pre-charge it accurately. And this, the definition is, uh, let's see, activate to pre-charge. You can nicely find it over here, for example, here has about 35 nanoseconds over here in this DRAM standard. So you need to obey these timing uh, 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 parameters uh, to make DRAM controllers work clearly. Well, as we've discussed in the last lecture, there's a lot of guard band in these timing parameters. So if you know what you're doing, you can reduce these latencies, but fundamentally there are some level beyond which you cannot reduce it because clearly you would be violating uh, the fact that the data is not ready uh, in terms of voltages and the sense amplifiers if you read, it, read the data too early over here. Clearly, you can optimize it by reducing the guard band, depending on the chip, depending on the temperature, as we discussed last time. Uh, but uh, there's still some sort of latency that you need to obey. Okay, so clearly there are many of these over here. I'm not going to go through. And so you can see that some of them are channel level constraints, not bank level. Some of them are rank level constraints because a, a rank uh, the different, different banks in the rank and different chips in the rank share the DRAM bus. These are the read to write delays, for example, the minimum read to write delay that you need to obey is about 11 to 15 nanoseconds over here. The minimum write to read delay is 7.5 nanoseconds here. So you can see there are many, many constraints and these, this is just uh, 
an example selection. And I like this work and this uh, other work on tiered latency DM because uh, I believe this is, uh, these are some of the clearest explanations of why these latencies exist, at least the earliest clearest earliest explanations uh, of why these latencies exist. Now, I guess here I should take the time uh, and uh, discuss, uh, this is very complicated clearly, right? You need to basically take into account all these different timing constraints, different, uh, and their scope, bank channel, et cetera. You may ask, why not use a single timing constraint, single latency? Well, uh, if you use a single one, then it'd be the worst case one, right? So uh, basically you need to pick what is the worst case. I think in this particular table, the worst case is TRC, activate to activate latency. It's 50 nanoseconds. Clearly picking a single latency saying, whatever I do to DRAM, the next command I'm going to issue after the previous command needs to wait this long. If you do that, you're losing a lot of performance clearly, right? Because you need to basically pick the worst case latency. In this particular table, it's 50. But there may be other commands that this particular table clearly doesn't consider, right? Uh, and it could be actually much larger. But that means that you're clearly wasting a lot of latency uh, if you actually take that approach of single timing parameter. That's why uh, existing DRAM standards have evolved to have a lot of different types of latencies uh, between, uh, specified between different commands so that you can improve performance uh, compared to a single timing parameter. Right? For example, you don't want to wait uh, 50 nanoseconds between an activate to read uh, because it just doesn't take, doesn't require for you to wait that long uh, in the underlying circuit uh, to be able to do the read after the activate. That's the idea. That's why we have this proliferation of these different timing constraints as you can see over here. Uh, so one question is how do the timing constraints in a data sheet differ from the constraints in a DDR standard? Uh, shouldn't contain both the same time? Yeah, exactly. Basically DDR standard, uh, the data sheet specifies things in the DDR standard essentially. Uh, that's the <laughs> that's the idea. Uh, so you can, uh, but I think data sheet specifies more about a chip as well. But uh, uh, they're basically uh, data sheet needs to obey the assuming that a particular chip that's manufactured is obeying the standard. The data sheet really needs to be consistent uh, with the DDR standard. But there is some leeway in the DDR standard in terms of the latencies. They don't exactly specify the latencies. So uh, that's why you, you still need the data sheets. Uh, uh, the standard gives you some leeway and some latencies, even though it's not flexible enough, clearly, as we've discussed. Okay, that's a good question. So uh, one other thing you can say, perhaps, which I think is actually a good uh, thinking going into the future is, why do I need to deal with all of these latencies? Uh, why don't I design a memory controller that basically sends a command or a request to DRAM? And whenever the DRAM is ready, with a response, it just sends the response. As opposed to a memory controller uh, trying to juggle all of these commands and get all of the latencies, timing constraints right. And I think that's a very good question, basically. What, you, uh, what that means is, as opposed to having a synchronous interface. So this is a very synchronous interface, right? In this case, uh, the interface is uh, a memory controller uh, uh, specifies, uh, knows how long to wait, and just waits for that long. And uh, after that, it can issue the command. Uh, and clearly this puts a lot of burden to the design of the memory controller. Whereas some other design could have made the choice of having an asynchronous interface. And this could be a handshake protocol between DRAM and the controller. The controller says, okay, here's my request. DRAM, send me the data back whenever you're ready. Clear this is asynchronous because DRAM doesn't know, uh, the memory controller doesn't know how long it will take internally. In DRAM, there's some controller, of course, that needs to handle the request. And that controller gives the data back. And I like that idea clearly. This is a more abstract, higher level interface. That way the controller can become simple and internally uh, the DRAM device itself still needs to have some sort of controller internally, but it doesn't expose it to the uh, memory controller. Uh, then they can actually handshake with that asynchronous interface. And I think going forward, uh, at some point, actually, the DM interface was that way. Uh, but over time, due to many reasons, like some of which are business reasons, uh, the memory controller stayed on the processor side uh, designed by non-memory companies uh, because it's essentially logic, right? Uh, as a result, uh, 
people came up with the synchronous interface uh, to uh, because memory controllers were not uh, designed by memory companies. But I believe going forward, having memory controllers close to DRAM, more intelligence close to DRAM is very much needed as we've discussed many times. And having an asynchronous interface from the processor to DRAM makes a lot of sense. Uh, but, and then you don't need all of these latencies clearly, at least known by the processor, but internally the memory controller needs to do something about these latencies, uh, but that memory controller can be present on the DRAM itself, right? So keep this in mind there. This is not the only way of doing things clearly. Okay, but this is the current way of doing things, uh, current predominant way of doing things actually uh, in DRAM. Okay, so if you read uh, the uh, tiered latency DRAM paper, which is one of the recommended readings or bonus readings, let's say, you can see uh, the reasons for these different latencies in a different way. Okay, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the course, DRAM controller design is becoming actually difficult. You can see that there are many heterogeneous agents that are uh, sending requests to the uh, memory controllers and the main memory is also becoming hybrid. So you're not controlling only one type of memory, but you're controlling multiple types of memory. And uh, there are different timing constraints for different memory types clearly, and you need to handle interference between these different agents. And there are many goals at the same time, performance, fairness, quality of service, energy efficiency, robustness, security, which were not present when I made the slide clearly, but those are important. Uh, and uh, the question is, of course, can you design a memory controller to be nicer in terms of, or easier to design? And I'm going to talk about an idea relatively quickly in the rest of uh, this part. And after we end, we're going to take a break and go into interference. But I like this idea because uh, it tries to lift the burden from the human designer as much as possible while opening up the possibility of having much higher performance and much more sophisticated scheduling policies and memory controllers. So you, you, you actually kill multiple birds with one stone essentially uh, by doing something like this. And essentially the high, uh, the high level idea is having a machine learning based memory controller. So the reality basically is it's clearly difficult to design a policy that maximizes just performance. Ignore even quality of service, energy efficiency, robustness, et cetera, just performance. It's difficult to design a policy that maximizes if you're a human because there are just too many things to think about as I've shown you earlier and all of those go into performance. And I'm ignoring even the other constraints that make it even harder. Why? Because there are just too many things to think about, too many states, uh, too many uh, things that you may need to uh, uh, take into account to get a good prioritization policy. And on top of this, uh, workloads change, uh, workload behavior changes, system behavior changes. So a policy that you think may be good for this workload and for this system may not be good because it's, uh, you have completely different access patterns, right? So I think humans are uh, limited in terms of the state spaces they can think of. We can think of maybe one, two, three, four, five. Okay, if you're lucky, 10 different variables at the same time. Uh, but going beyond 10 is very difficult. And if things change a lot, designing a policy that works well under all conditions, all, all workloads and systems is very difficult. So our dream when we were doing this work is, uh, was this basically, wouldn't it be nice if the DRM control automatically found a good scheduling policy, prioritization order on so. Uh, and clearly performance function of the memory control is important. So you get requests from one core or different cores and to resolve memory contention by scheduling requests. The key question is how do you schedule requests to maximize system performance? And that's what we're targeting in this work that I'm going to describe rel relatively quickly. We call the self-optimizing DRM controllers and problem I've already given you, it's difficult for human designers to design a policy that can be high performance basically, that can adapt itself well to different workloads and different system conditions. The idea here is to design a memory control that adapts its scheduling policy to workload behavior and system conditions using machine learning. And hopefully machine learning can find better policies based on online learning uh, of, the, of what's going on in the system and the workloads and different access patterns. And uh, our observation, the key observation was that reinforcement learning maps nicely to memory control. And we treated memory control as a reinforcement learning agent. Uh, which dynamically and continuously learns and employs the best scheduling policy to maximize long-term performance. So uh, all of us as humans are reinforcement learning agents, actually. Uh, we interact with our environment. Uh, we observe what's going on in the environment, which is the environmental state or our internal state as well. So this could be any state that, we're, uh, that we can observe. And we take an action based on the state that we find ourselves in. 
And hopefully we're intelligent enough that we take the action that maximizes our rewards. So that's what a reinforcement learning agent is. Uh, and if we are intelligent beings, for example, the state, maybe the stove is really hot. And if we're smart enough, or if we've learned enough, we don't, we don't touch the stove. <laughs> the action is not touching the hot surface. And then we don't get a negative reward, meaning we don't get punished. Clearly our, our hand doesn't get burned, right? Uh, so, but if, uh, assuming that we didn't learn in that state, we touch the stove and we get punished. And in the future, when we see that state, hot stove, we don't take the action of touching the stove, right? We maybe decide to take the action of turning off the stove first uh, so that we can maximize our long-term reward or minimize our punishment, right? So that's the idea. That's clearly an example. And in psychology, this is very fundamental. Some psychologists believe that humans are nothing but reinforcement learning agents. I think that's an extreme thought, like B.F. Skinner, for example. He believed very strongly that he was actually a big proponent of reinforcement learning in psychology. Uh, and he believed very strongly uh, that uh, humans are just reinforcement learning agents. I think uh, real evidence points that that's not just exactly true, or we don't understand reinforcement learning enough uh, to make a statement. But, uh, but he, he was actually able to train pigeons in the Second World War uh, to using reinforcement learning, pure reinforcement learning, to uh, deliver the actions deliver the messages to the right people during the war. So he, he actually did wonders with reinforcement learning by training pigeons. But you may be aware of uh, Ivan Paolo's dogs. Uh, he, he, he was really the first person who discovered uh, reinforcement learning uh, and basically conditioned the dogs to associate uh, bells uh, with food, such that the dogs would come when they hear the bell to get the reward, which is food, right? Uh, so clearly this reinforcement learning is very generally applicable to nature and we're applying it to uh, the uh, memory, memory controllers in this case. There's a lot of theory behind reinforcement learning in, uh, in machine learning uh, and uh, uh, there are a lot of convergence properties that you can prove, for example. But if you look at uh, the traditional reinforcement learning, not the deep reinforcement learning, today people are combining deep neural networks with reinforcement learning. I'm not talking about that here. This is really classical traditional reinforcement learning. You can provably uh, converge in traditional reinforcement learning, assuming some properties are true. And one of those properties is that, well, one of the key properties is that your agent needs to be a Markov decision process. You need to be able to model your agent as a Markov decision process. I'm not going to go into the details of this. You can read the paper. But a Markov decision process is basically you, move, you can move from state to state with some probability of jumping from one state to another state. That's the Markov decision process. And we, uh, uh, a memory control is really a Markov decision process. Uh, it's really implementing a Markov decision process. It moves from state to state, uh, and it, use, it has some probability of going from one state to another state. And basically, we're replacing the memory scheduler with an intelligent agent that observes the state of the system and state of itself and takes a, a, schedules a command that would maximize data bus utilization. That's the idea over here. And the assumption is that data bus utilization, maximizing data bus utilization is good for performance. Of course, that may not be true, but in, the, in, our, in our system, that was true, uh, at least mostly true, let's say. But this is important, clear. Reward function is really important. If you get it wrong, you may actually optimize for the wrong thing. And clearly, selecting state, state attributes is really important. And over time, what the controller learns, hopefully, is to choose the actions, which is the scheduled commands, that would maximize the long-term data bus utilization. Because by choosing the reward function and how it's updated, you can learn to maximize long-term utilization, not just take into account the next cycle's data bus utilization, but take into account uh, next n cycle's data bus utilization, basically, if you do the updates uh, correctly over here. And I'll leave you to read the paper to understand that this is classific classical reinforcement learning. Uh, and if you're really interested in reinforcement learning, there's a book written about it. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, Rich Sutton's book. Uh, it's, it's an old book, actually. It was, I think, first uh, written in 1990s. Uh, and we used that book uh, partially for this uh, work. Uh, but it was really up recently updated in 2018. And you can find it on Sutton's website, I think. And uh, he actually uh, uses this example of reinforcement learning-based memory controllers as one of the recent uh, 
successful examples of reinforcement learning applications. So you can actually see a chapter, uh, see a section in one chapter in that book that talks about what I'm describing to you right now. Okay, so uh, I, I'm giving you the basic idea. Of course, the rest is how do you make it work? And uh, clearly, it's easier said and done, said than done, because making things work is really the most important part of uh, computer architecture. Having great ideas is important, but if you don't make them work, those great ideas are in the end worthless, right? Uh, or if somebody else doesn't make them work, if those if those great ideas may be worthless, right? Uh, so I think making this work is really the important part. Uh, and I think it's in general, making things work is really important. Uh, now that I've derailed a little bit, I think I would recommend one more thing uh, to, to you uh, by another Turing Award winner, Michael Stonebreaker. He, he did seminal work on databases and he won the Turing Award, I believe in 2011. And he gave a, a lecture, Turing lecture in one of the ISCA conferences. Uh, and I think my TA should really link uh, to these things that I'm describing right now, Sutton's book. Uh, uh, Michael Stonebreaker's lecture. And Michael Stonebreaker's lecture is all about making things work. <laughs> so how do I make things work? <laughs> and uh, he basically had a lot of ideas on databases and uh, not, but he didn't stand, uh, stay only in the ideas, but he really made things work. And it's all about the importance of making things work. And if you stop without making things work, then you have a problem basically, then you will never have the impact uh, that you can have. Okay. So that's derailing, but I think that's really important also. Uh, and this is a beautiful lecture to watch, I would recommend. Uh, I was there in the audience. So, and I think I watched it afterwards as well on YouTube. It's, it's somewhere on YouTube, uh, probably published by ACM. Uh, but uh, my TAs will put it on uh, the Skypes. Okay, so uh, let me go back to the context. Basically, uh, we're using, so how do we make it work? How do we make the self-optimizing DM controls work? Uh, the idea is to associate system states and actions uh, with long-term reward values. Each action at a given state leads to a learned reward. Uh, and you need to schedule the command uh, with the highest estimated long-term reward value in each state. That's the idea. And the basic, uh, the basic memory controller continuously updates the reward values for state action pairs. So uh, for example, uh, if you're in a state where you have so many read requests, let's say, I just made it up but that's one of the state values. Uh, if you take action X, you get reward uh, value that's this big. If you take action Y, you get rewards value that's a bit smaller. So you choose action X over action Y. So basically at a given state where state is represented as a collection, as a summary of multiple different state attributes, and it's, it becomes really important art and science how to represent state, uh, which action should you take? So you basically have a table that you index using the state and the possible action, and you get a value called a Q value. In this case, we use something called Q learning. That's a very fundamental reinforcement learning mechanism. Uh, and basically this Q value corresponds to the potential reward that you're going to get in the future. Uh, so Anika sent something. So it's 2014, apparently. I gave 2011, so good. thanks for correcting me. Uh, but basically, uh, you pick the Q value, you pick the reward that least that is the highest value. And you continuously update state action pairs based on the reward values that data bus utilization that you see. So that's the idea. So it's actually a very simple application of reinforcement learning to memory controllers. And it works as we will see in a little bit, but the difficulty is specifying the reward function. In this case, we specified it such that you get a positive reward for scheduling read and write such that uh, you uh, such that you utilize the data bus and you don't get any reward if you don't utilize the data bus. And the goal is to update the uh, reward function such that you, uh, to ma you maximize the long-term data bus utilization. Actions are the easier part, I would say. These are different actions you can potentially take, but even then we actually have distinguished between load and store misses, for example, so that we can learn better. And uh, we also distinguish between a preemptive pre-charge and a pre-charge uh, when you actually have a request that uh, wants a pre-charge. Preemptive pre-charge is uh, you have a row buffer that's open, but there's no request that's waiting for that bank. Can you, do you preemptively issue a pre-charge? So that might be a good idea if your next request that's going to come in the future is to the same bank, and but to, the, to, but to some other row, right? So you can learn potentially to issue preemptive pre-charges. And no off is also an action, clearly. You don't need to take any you don't need to, you don't issue any uh, requests 
uh, in this case, our command. And state attributes is one of the hardest parts. In modern machine learning systems, I think this can also be learned with some difficulty. But uh, what we did over here is we did static uh, learning uh, or elimination or feature selection of state attributes. Essentially, we looked at more than 200 or so state attributes that we could come up with. And then we narrowed it down using simulation to, I think, eight attributes or something like this. You can count the number over here. Basically, number of reads, writes, and load missed in the transaction queue happen to be important, number of pending writes, and reorder buffer heads. These are the oldest instructions waiting for the reference row. And request relative position in the reorder buffer uh, in terms of uh, how important it is, uh, how close it is, close it is to, uh, to the oldest instruction, basically. These happen to be important. Clearly, you can guess why these may be important, right? Uh, for example, if a request is closer to the head of the reorder buffer, it's closest to the oldest instruction, so it's more likely to stall the processor because it may not be overlapped with other requests. It may not be overlapped uh, with other, uh, um, other uh, computations also that are going on in the core. OK, so clearly, there's effort that needs to be done by the designer to figure out what the state attributes should be what the reward function should be and what the actions should be. So the designer job shifts to specifying all of these. And some of these are harder than others. I think reward function is harder, especially if you want to take into account quality of service, interference, different types of agents, different types of metrics to maximize, not just data bus utilization, but you want to maximize some other things as well. So this becomes very complicated. State attributes, I think, is complicated, but you could learn some of this. I think actions are relatively easy, but you need to be careful. So human designers' burden reduces, in my opinion, uh, to uh, specifying these as opposed to specifying a good policy. OK, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of performance results, but basically, this memory controller that's machine learning based provides large and robust performance improvements over many human design policies that we uh, des uh, designed to, to try to beat it basically. And you can read, you can see the results. It basically buys 20% performance, where the headroom is 70% in this particular system setup. In some other system setups, the headroom can be much larger. And you can see that with two channels, you get even higher performance improvement potential. OK, uh, I'm not going to talk more about uh, this. Uh, but let's talk about the upsides and downsides. I, I, I think this is actually a very good way of designing sophisticated controllers of the future. In general, we should really be investigating machine learning policies uh, to design better controllers, especially when the controllers are really difficult to design and difficult to optimize. So the big upside of using self-optimizing DRM controllers using reinforcement learning is now you have continuous learning in the presence of changing environment, changing workload, uh, and the workload characteristics actually change relatively quickly. And so you can take advantage of a lot of requests coming by and a lot of decisions that you make so that you can quickly adapt and learn. Uh, and this redu reduces designer burden in finding a good scheduling policy. Designer doesn't dictate the policy, but they need to specify what system variables might be useful, uh, what target to optimize, but they don't need to say how to optimize it. So that's really important. How is done by reinforcement learning. Of course, there are potential limitations and future work opportunities. I think of these as future work opportunities because there's very little real work that's done in this area, in my opinion. You can see that this paper was published 12 years ago. But uh, even though there are a lot of works that did other things uh, and that were inspired by this paper, uh, I think memory controllers still need uh, an approach that's more generalized, that builds on what we've discussed. Uh, how, to how to specify different objectives is really important, in my opinion. How to do that accurately and nicely is not easy. Uh, but that's where the research comes in. Hardware complexity is important. In this work, if you read it, you will see that we use some tricks to reduce the hardware complexity, uh, which I'm not going to go into. And I think it's nice to use those tricks. But still, this is not as simple as FRFCFS, clearly, and as simple as some of the controls that we, we have discussed and we're going to discuss into the future. Uh, so this remains to be seen. But of course, I think there's. it's good to think that uh, I think some hardware complexity is justified in the memory controller because you're adding more intelligence and learning capability in the controller. Uh, there's no uh, gain. There's no free lunch, basically. Uh, you get learning capability in the controller. That's great for adaptation and higher performance, et cetera. Uh, you need to pay the cost of hardware complexity. But of course, you want to minimize the hardware complexity as much as possible. And I think 
one of the interesting things is design mindset and flow. So uh, when you talk about this with real uh, memory controller designers, they cannot wrap their heads around it because uh, the design mindset is not this way. Design mindset is, oh, I design my controller and I take into account issues, I own it, and I believe I know everything works. <laughs> now that's not great mindset clearly for innovation as we've discussed, but there's some, there's some benefit to that sort of mindset. And the benefit is really testing. Uh, how do you test a memory controller whose policies you don't even know how it will happen? So there needs to be different testing strategies. That's why I put flow over here. So design and testing flow needs to change over here. Whereas if you constrain the policy uh, by designing it in some way, then clearly you can test it more easily. Whereas here, you don't even know what the policy should be because the policy is determined using online learning, right? So testing becomes harder. Uh, so I think these are actually really good uh, research topics also going into the future. How do you get rid of the reds as much as possible over here? Uh, not just in DRM controllers, but in other controllers as well. So there's a huge opportunity here, uh, I think, uh, in both specialized controllers as well as uh, in general. Okay, so if you're interested in this, I think I would recommend uh, this paper. Uh, I really like this idea and I think there's a lot of promise. I think this is one of the bonus papers, although I don't remember, frankly, uh, if it was bonus or real. I think it was bonus, so you can take a look at it. So uh, this is an example of self-optimizing uh, data-driven computing architectures that I promised that I would introduce to you at some earlier lecture in one of the earliest lectures, actually. Uh, this is also called data-driven. Why? Because uh, the architecture itself optimizes itself by learning, learning from the data that it sees. And the data in this case is uh, the state and action pairs that it sees plus uh, the reward values that it observes based on the state action pairs in the past. Okay, so let me uh, broaden this a little bit. So system architecture design today is very much human driven. Humans design every single policy, how to do the things. As a result, there are many too simple short-sighted policies all over the system. Caching policies are another example. SSD policies are another example. Uh, hybrid memory control policies are another example. Prefetching policies are another example. Uh, branch prediction policies are another example, although branch prediction is probably the only place where people have employed successfully a very limited amount of machine learning in hardware. And uh, the idea is perceptron-based branch prediction. And this was proposed in early 2000s, 2001 by Daniel Jimenez and uh, some Samsung uh, uh, branch predictors actually employ these perceptron-based memory, uh, not memory controllers, branch predictors. Perceptron is actually the simplest uh, implementation of a neuron, artificial neuron in machine learning. So it's a single layer network. Well. It doesn't, you don't want to call it a network at that point. Basically, it's a single layer learning engine. Uh, it's, it's a very simple representation of a neuron. And uh, it works essentially for branch prediction, actually. If you, if you watch my branch prediction lecture from digital design and computer architecture, you will see that it actually gains significant performance improvement. It's not the state of the art. There are other human design policies that actually do better. But I think perceptron-based policies have the potential to do even better if they're actually optimized going into the future also. But that's the only place where a hardware architecture decision is made using some sort of machine learning. But you can see that it's very simple machine learning. It's not reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is actually much more sophisticated than a single perceptron. Uh, okay, so uh, there's no automatic driven, data-driven policy learning in many uh, parts of the system, except for maybe a limited set of branch predictors. And as a result, there's almost no learning. So controllers don't take lessons from their past actions. So uh, it's unfortunate that I have a controller in the memory control. Let's pick the memory controller since we're talking about memory controllers in my machine over here uh, or my machine over here. Clearly these controllers have been operating for five years in my pocket uh, or somewhere. Uh, they've seen many, many applications, many, many decisions they made, but they have learned nothing. <laughs> Basically they're still making the same mistakes. So that's, fundamentally not intelligent as you can see, right? Because they're not learning from these past actions because they don't have the capacity to even introspect into the past actions because they're not designed that way. They're designed to look at states, take actions, period. You look at some state values, you do some prioritization, you do take some action, done. There's no feedback loop. As a result, uh, none of these controllers are really intelligent. 
So I think that's very sad today because if we're really designing intelligent machines, we should be designing these intelligent controllers also. So the key question is, of course, can we design fundamentally intelligent architectures? And I think this is a huge problem with bridging the gap between uh, a higher level of intelligence like humans uh, or even animals, let's say, and uh, these machines. These machines uh, at the very fundamental level of how hardware is designed are not really intelligent. Uh, and uh, you can argue that maybe the software that's running on them is intelligent, but it's not even clear uh, that that is the case. Uh, I think uh, it can, it, things can be much, much better. Okay, so intelligent architecture, in my opinion, is data-driven. Uh, and as a machine learns the best policies, how to do things as opposed to humans dictating things. As a result, the machine finds, discovers sophisticated workload driven, changing far-sighted policies that humans cannot have imagined. Uh, and you have automatic data driven policy learning and all controllers are intelligent data driven agents. I think uh, self-optimizing memory controllers that I've described earlier gives you a starting point because it really uh, satisfies all of these criteria here, well, except for the old controllers part, it's one controller, but I believe we need to really rethink the design of all controls. So there's a huge opportunity for research and design to make really, to design really fundamentally intelligent architectures going forward. So with this, I think we've covered uh, uh, data centric part, data driven part. I have promised you that we will cover the data aware part. I'm going to talk about that later on. Uh, but we will uh, not talk about it in this lecture because this lecture is really about memory controls and interference. Uh, so hopefully uh, we, will lead, uh, we will have machines that are much more fundamentally intelligent going into the future. I picked this uh, stock picture of a brain clearly over here, but uh, clearly we want to surpass the brain going into the future in my opinion, because there are limitations to what the brain can do also. So there's one question, is it necessary to do this learning online? The device could also analyze part of its past actions when it's idle and then adapt its policies for the future. So I would argue that what you're suggesting is really uh, online. <laughs> so basically idle means I think uh, you find some idle times and you do the learning uh, during that time. Uh, I think an offline policy is really before the design. That's what I would call offline. Uh, and what we've done in this work uh, that I mentioned is look at offline policies, statically designed memory controllers that uh, basically used, you're still learning, but the weights of, uh, let's say the tables of the reinforcement learning uh, is filled in uh, offline before the program starts. And we found out that the online learning actually buys a lot more performance. So I think uh, what you suggest is somewhere in between, let's say, uh, when you're idle, you learn and you use that learning for the next period until you're idle again. And I think you lose significant opportunity if you don't do the online learning according to the results that we present in the paper that I just mentioned. So that's a very good question, actually. Uh, if, you, if you do the way you suggest or the way we implemented uh, offline learning, I think you lose a lot of opportunity. Because, well, and the reason is uh, you, you, you basically miss the opportunity of learning from uh, actions that happen in a fine-grained manner. Okay, the question is granularity, of course. How often do you learn? Online means you learn from every single action, right? And we found out that that uh, leads to significant benefit as opposed to uh, doing it at the beginning of a workload or before the workload starts. Uh, and I think idle periods are also similar uh, from that perspective. Now you go into the def definition of what is idle, right? Uh, how often do you become idle? Are there points where you actually become idle in some systems? You may not actually become idle. Uh, so your question is really important, but I think online learning has significant benefit based on the results that we've seen and based on some of the other results that I've seen with the branch prediction, for example. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, but I think this sort of uh, intelligence, I think requires also rethinking across the stack. So what we've done over here is really designing hardware that's intelligent, but I think you really need intelligence across the stack, this reinforcement learning, not just reinforcement learning, but self-optimization ideas are really applicable across the stack. Your algorithms may be self-optimizing as well, right? Your, uh, your system software could be self-optimizing in terms of the memory allocation it does, scheduling it does, uh, and who knows what else over here. So this is really up to the imagination and creativity, I think. Uh, but I think this is an area that's not very, very well trodden. Uh, 
in system design? How do we use machine learning to actually improve all of the decision making that goes on in the entire computing stack that we're used to? And maybe how do we blend uh, different parts uh, of this? But of course, we need to get there step by step by examining particular controllers, as we've also discussed. Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, I'm going to take a break at this point. And let's take a, I guess, 10 minute break.